Hello everyone and welcome back to Royalty Now, where we reveal the faces of the past and talk about their history. Almost exactly 100 years ago, British archaeologist Howard Carter discovered a stairwell in the Egyptian Valley of the Kings. The very next day, he followed those stairs and was thrilled to find an undiscovered tomb with its inner door still sealed, an extremely rare find. In it was the boy King Tutankhamun, a pharaoh who had reigned for only 10 years, the blink of an eye in historical context. It was a discovery for the ages, one that revealed thousands of perfectly preserved Egyptian antiquities and captured the public imagination. Today, we'll talk about what we know of King Tut's history, his mummy, and then of course reveal what he may have looked like. King Tutankhamun was born in Egypt around 1341 BCE, during what's called the New Kingdom period. This period introduced us to some of Egypt's most famous pharaohs, like Hatshepsut, Tutmos, and Akhenaten. Akhenaten is believed to be Tutankhamun's father. He was the pharaoh who upended Egyptian religion, shifting from a polytheistic tradition to a monotheistic one. This new religion centered around a deity called Aten, the sun god. Akhenaten moved the Egyptian capital to Amarna, and his era is known as the Amarna period. Tut's biological mother's actual identity is unknown, but we do have her mummy. Genetic analysis shows that she's likely the younger lady mummy, found in tomb KV-55, and she was found to be the full sister of her husband, Akhenaten. Thank you so much to Wondrium for sponsoring today's video. Wondrium is a streaming service dedicated to satisfying those with curious minds. And I was so excited to dig into the research about King Tut for this episode. I think the reason we are so endlessly fascinated by King Tut is the perfectly preserved objects found alongside him. It just makes history feel so much closer, a reminder that the past happened to real people. The Wondrium episode called King Tut Forgotten Treasure was so fun to watch. It includes so much more information about the objects found with him, and also digs into some of the theories that the tomb was not meant for him at all. It also highlights what's possibly the earliest known image of the boy king, shown in the arms of a nurse on a stone relief. Wondrium has a carefully curated collection of short and long form videos, documentaries, and academic style content. Each time you log in, there will be something new to discover, and you can watch it from anywhere. I actually watched the Tut episode while walking on the treadmill and it made my workout fly by. If you're stumped for gift ideas this holiday season, why not give the gift of Wondrium? Visit wondrium.com slash royaltynowstudios or click the link in the description box to get started with a free trial. The only real reason for Tut's notoriety is his tomb. Before its discovery, Tutankhamun was barely a footnote in most Egyptian histories. We don't actually know much about his reign. Ascending to the throne around the age of nine, he would have been too young to truly rule. He likely relied very heavily on his advisors. The young king had inherited a country in turmoil, weak and fractured from the religious upheavals. This was Tut's main agenda as king, reversing his father's radical religious reforms. As he ascended the throne, he changed his name officially from Tutankhaten to Tutankhamun, removing the association to Aten, the sun god. This name change not only denounced Aten, but also everything his father Akhenaten had stood for. Tut would return Egypt's religion to its polytheistic form, reestablish Thebes as Egypt's capital, and begin to rebuild shrines and temples that had been pillaged by his father. Tut was married to his half-sister Ankhesenamun, but the couple were unlucky only having two daughters who both died stillborn, no doubt due to the generations of inbreeding, which also affected King Tut. In fact, many health issues King Tut suffered from are attributed to inbreeding, which we'll dive into further when we get into the recreations of his appearance. Tutankhamun died in 1323 BCE, around the age of 18 or 19, and was buried in an atypically small tomb in the Valley of the Kings. And so his body stayed, encased in nine layers of protection from the outside world. 3,000 years later, Howard Carter, under the patronage of British Lord Carnarvon, went looking for it. 
Carter had been excavating the Valley of the Kings for a few years when he set his sights on finding the Boy King's tomb. He believed that there was at least one more undiscovered tomb in the valley, probably buried under piles of debris from other excavations. But finally, in November, Carnarvon received an excited telegram from Howard Carter. At last, I've made a wonderful discovery in the valley, a magnificent tomb with seals intact. The tomb would become known as KV-62. Tut's tomb was found during what can only be described as the Wild West of Egyptology. At this time, the British occupied Egypt but didn't officially hold it. Unfortunately, the entire media storm and credit around the tomb's discovery fully circumvented Egyptian authorities. Carnarvon even signed an exclusive contract with the London Times, trying to give the paper exclusive rights to images from the tomb. But there was finally some justice in the end. The treasures went to the Egyptian Museum and not to the British or Metropolitan Museums as Carnarvon originally promised. Some even thought the justice extended even further. Lord Carnarvon died mysteriously just four months after entering the tomb. Journalists in the 1920s were swift to capitalize on the curse of the pharaohs, and they attributed over a dozen deaths to the curse. Although later studies showed that most people who entered the tomb lived an average lifespan. Later in November, Carter's team would begin their excavation, and the riches they found were unimaginable. 413 small-scale models of servants meant to help Tut in the afterlife. A golden throne depicting Tutankhamun and his wife. And a scale model of the king, which some scholars believe to be a garment mannequin. But one specifically baffled archaeologists. They found an iron dagger, made centuries before humans had even invented the process of forging iron. It was found to have been made from a meteorite that had fallen to Earth, no doubt a completely mystical object to the ancient Egyptians. Although these objects are magnificent, there is still a sense of historical removal. But also inside the tomb are a few utterly human, heartbreaking details. When Carter opened the tomb, it revealed the glorious golden sarcophagus cover, but it also revealed a wreath of flowers found around his head which Carter said still retained their colors after nearly 3,000 years. The mummies of Tut's stillborn daughters were placed near him to meet in the afterlife. The tomb also contained his childhood toys buried with him. Many of the items showed ducks, an animal which he seemed to have had a fondness for, also an important animal to Egyptian society. Unfortunately, the mummy itself was very damaged. In fact, it was actually charred, it's thought that a high amount of oil used on Tut's body during burial actually combusted inside the tomb in antiquity, causing large amounts of damage before it was even opened. In addition, Carter and his team were not gentle. They ended up basically chiseling the mummy out of the coffin, resulting in massive damage. The trauma on the mummy, which we now know was sustained after death and burial, was what caused scholars at some points to believe that Tut was brutally murdered, and many theories and mysteries still swirl around his mummy and his burial. But for now, we have to focus on the things we do know, and try to get to the truth of what Tut might have looked like, and how he died. We know Tutankhamun was significantly inbred, which no doubt led to some health issues. However, he may not have been as sickly as some recreations suggest. There's a lot of evidence indicating his death was surprising to his family, meaning that he must have been in decent health beforehand. Many of his genetic maladies were found to be maybe nuisances in daily life, but not his actual cause of death. A 2010 study confirmed much of what we know about Tut's body and death. It was found that he suffered from colder disease, which can impair the ability to walk and may have caused swelling and pain in his foot. This is backed up by the numerous walking canes that were found in his tomb, which showed signs of use and wear, although Professor Salima Akram says the use of them seems fairly light. An interesting hypothesis for Tut and his parents has been that they suffered from Marfan syndrome. Now this is a syndrome that can cause abnormally long limbs and fingers, slightly feminized appearance, a curved spine, and flat feet. 
Now what's so interesting is that the artistic style of the Amarna period actually backs this up. The busts and statues of Akhenaten and Nefertiti, while being more lifelike than other eras of Egyptian art, are also really feminine looking. They show long limbs and androgynous features. For a long time, Egyptologists have speculated about whether these images reflected the truth or were just artistic license. But research done in 2007 finally answered some of these questions. DNA and analysis of Tut's immediate family members, his father, Akhenaten, his grandmother, and more, indicated no evidence of Marfan syndrome. Instead, on King Tut's mummy, the team found a mild case of scoliosis, a left foot that showed signs of either a birth defect or colder disease, and an elongated head. It's unclear right now if this is a sign of genetic or cultural elongation. Head binding to achieve a tapered skull has been seen as a sign of beauty as recently as the 1950s. What was clear was that the style of the Amarna period was much more artistic than physical. But this still didn't answer the question that had been burning in the minds of many historians since the tomb's discovery. How or why did King Tut die at such a young age? Genetic testing may have found the answer. After testing King Tut for the parasite responsible for causing malaria, the results came back that he not only suffered from one, but multiple strains of the disease. At the time he died, Tut had suffered repeated infections of the most severe strains. Even now, in modern times, malaria is still an incredibly dangerous disease, with over 600,000 people dying from it as recently as 2020. The team also found a fracture in his left leg, an open wound with no signs of healing. This new revelation, coupled with the repeated infections from malaria, point to a scenario of an already weakened king suffering an accident that ultimately led to his demise. Even with this new evidence, currently, there is no way of telling exactly how bad his condition was, or if anything else contributed to his death. His mummy is simply too damaged, and his time and history too short, too far gone, and too shrouded in mystery. So what do we know about how he would have looked in real life? We don't have that many images of King Tut from his own lifetime, just because of how short his reign was but they do all look quite consistent with one another. Some reconstructions of King Tut have been made directly from his mummy, but Egyptologists disagree on how accurate these are. It's been noted that reconstructing directly from a mummy just isn't always reasonable, since the tissue shrinks by about 50%. But his body does tell us a lot about his appearance. We know that he stood about 5'6", and was fairly skinny, even described by scholars as frail. It's been noted from his DNA that he could be considered North African. In the modern day, North Africans represent a huge range of skin tones and hair textures, so what I'm representing is just one possibility. In terms of hairstyle, we know that at the time of his burial, he had a shaved head. Most scholars agree that the images of King Tut made by his own people during his own lifetime are what we should be looking towards for accuracy. Zahi Huas thinks Tut's burial mask is probably the best representation of him. A CT scan indicated he had a partial cleft palate, probably only noticeable inside his mouth, and an obvious overbite with buck teeth. Professor Salima Ikram told Live Science, I think he looked as he was represented, except that he had more of an overbite. For my recreations, I'm going to use his famous burial mask, as well as the effigy of him found in the tomb for reference. This small effigy was made to represent Tut as a child, symbolizing regeneration. So let's take a look at what King Tut's real face might have been, from a child to a young adult, now.
you all so much for watching and we'll see you all for the next video.